And so here we go, uh, week nine office hours, we're going to look at homework 7.2, a couple of problems from there, then we're going to talk about stoichiometry and the limiting reactant prep activity. Uh, let's start with the 7.2 stuff, that's stuff from last week that will be on the quiz tonight, so let's take a look at it. Um, so problem 10 was just, um, you had to identify the reaction, and so it was like H2C2O4 aqueous plus... H2C2O4 aqueous plus MnO4 aqueous plus H plus aqueous. And that made CO2 gas plus um, MN2, I think it's supposed to be a 2 plus charge, um, plus H2O. That is a HC2, H2C2O4 and an H plus. Weird one. Okay, so there's a couple things we need to check. MN2 plus, let me see. Let me take a look at this real quick. Hmm. Okay. Oh, it's MNO4 minus. Okay, cool. So we've got a couple different options of what's going on here. Oh, I see what's going on here. So right away, I see water, and I'm like, oh, maybe it's an acid-base reaction. Right? And I see I see an H plus, so I'm like, oh, maybe it's an acid base reaction. That that looks pretty promising. But I also see my carbon changing and I see my manganese changing. So this is, and I warned you about these. So I don't have any of the typical bases that we're used to. The only bases we've really talked about this quarter are the hydroxide salts, calcium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, and sodium carbonate. Those are kind of the only things we've talked about in bases. And I don't see any of those. However, this o, the, the oxygens here, they can act like bases. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing some amount of H pluses moving around, which makes me see think acid base, but I'm also seeing charge changes. So let's change the charge here. Um, this is a minus eight. This is going to be a manganese plus seven oxidation state to a manganese plus two oxidation state. You know how I got manganese plus seven? Let's do that real quick. So I'm looking at the manganate anion, permanganate anion. So this would be like, this would be, we actually did this one in class and I'm thinking about it. This would be like KMnO4 solid getting mixed into H2O, going to K plus aqueous plus MnO4 minus aqueous. All right. We did this compound in class, so we should be able to do this one. If we're just looking at the manganese, sorry, the permanganate. Um, we know that this is going to be the oxidation state of oxygen times 4 plus the oxidation state of manganese times 1, and it has to add up to the minus 1. Now, manganese is variable, but I know what the oxidation state of oxygen is. I know that's going to be a minus 2. So that's going to give me, if I just do this real quick underneath it, that's going to give me minus 8 plus manganese is equal to minus 1. Add the minus 8 over, subtract, you know, subtract it from both sides, it's like add, or add it to both sides. You're going to get that manganese is a plus 7. Now, I can kind of do that in my head because I'm like, that's minus 8. I want a negative 1 left over. Plus 7 minus 8 gives me minus 1. And you can practice it a bit, it starts to you start to be able to do it in your head. The important thing here, I'm gonna erase this bit at the bottom if that's okay. This is also a strong oxidizing agent. It, we used it to kick off the thermite reaction. Don't get it on your hands. Fun thing, it's a purple color. So, but you put it into water, it can do all kinds of reactions. Um, when we've got an ion like this, its oxidation state and its charge are the same number, right? And that's part of where 
when we first started learning about this, um, we kind of used charge and oxidation state interchangeably because most of the things we were dealing with were ions where the term was interchangeable. But you can see in the permanganate anion, the MnO4 minus, that manganese isn't actually like a plus seven ion. It's in a covalent bond. It's not, it's not ionic. It doesn't have a charge by itself. It only has a charge because of the way it's interacting with oxygens, which is the oxidation state. Uh, and I can see it's changing. Plus seven to plus two, it's changing. So this is definitely a redox reaction. I think this one is technically redox and acid base, technically. But it's acid base in a way that we don't understand yet because understanding how the oxygens in the permanganate can act like bases is something we haven't gone over. So I'm guessing it accepts redox as an answer? Yeah. Does it also accept acid base? Okay. No. Uh, yeah, I had tried acid base first. I yeah. Like, and I think... Like, yeah, that's oxalic acid. So, but it's because, like... Since the charges move, the oxidation stays. Yeah. So, well, so here's the thing is I think this is technically acid base and redox. This is one of those weird cases. And I'm I would, like I said, I would not give you one of these on quizzes and exams. On homework, it's kind of fun to think about. But this is one of those weird cases that it fits into more than one of our categories. This is acid base and it's redox. If we had, um, let's see here. If there was some sulfide around as well, it would also form a manganese, uh, manganese sulfide precipitate. And it could be acid base redox and precipitation. Um, someone can take this chair, too. So yeah, that's a weird one. That's a weird one. Um, yeah, and you can take my chair. Or is it I'll just come a... back right OK, what's that? Uh, I'll come back right now. Okay. I just wanted to see if you did have that. Question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Officers are happening. We're doing it. I'm uh, working on a 7.2 questions. So that was number 10. Everyone good on that one? Weird one. Let's try number 11. Okay. Um, so number 11 was just kind of like guessing the products and balancing it. So is um, so BaCl2 as a solid, you put it in the water, and then it's Ba2 plus aqueous, and then plus the other product. And then there was another one below that that was like Cl2 gas, um, put it into water, and then you predict the product. Okay, now this is a really important problem that is easy to get the answer for. That's easy to get the answer. You can just Google it. You can look it up. You can kind of like guess and check. But the concept of why these two answers is different is actually a really important concept. So what kind of compound is this? What's that? Is it covalent if there's no charge? Maybe. What are other options? What's that? Is it just a solid compound? It's a solid compound. We got an S here, so it's a solid. Could be a covalent. Could be a. Could be an ionic. What else could it be? Could be a metallic. Right. So let's think about our definitions for those. If it's metallic, it would be a metal bonded with a metal. We've got a metal bonded with a non-metal. So that's not metallic. It's going to end up being ionic. Covalence non-metal with non-metal. Um, ionic is metal with non-metal. Now, the thing that, mess, that, that people have trouble with is it looks like a metal with a non-metal and a non-metal. So is it like ionic and covalent? Or is it just ionic? Like what's going on here? And that's where recognizing that barium has a plus two charge to it and that chloride has a minus one charge to it, we can see, oh, actually, if I drew, if I tried to draw a picture of what barium chloride looked like, I would draw like a barium plus two here 
and it would be ionically bonded to two Cl minuses. So that means when I dissolve this in water, my predicted product would be two Cl minus aqueous. Right? And so that comes from identifying that we have ionic bonds. We've got a certain number of chlorines. This isn't chlorine gas attached to barium. This is two chloride ions attached to a barium ion. And so recognizing that means we predict that for our product. Now what about Cl2 gas in water? Think about pools. Like chlorine and O2 together, and then be like, less, or not O2, O. This becomes chlorine gas dissolved in water. Right, so here we can recognize this chlorine with chlorine. It's just a non metal with a non metal. There's no metals around. Non metal with non metal, that's a covalent bond. Covalent bonds don't break when we put them in water. Except for acidic bonds. Those are a weird case. Um, when we put this into water, there's all kinds of intermolecular forces that are possible. Maybe there's a side reaction that occurs. It turns out there's not. Um, we talked about this phenomena in particular when we were doing our types of reactions lab because we had aqueous chlorine solution. Remember, that was the demo I did where it turned like brown. Um, we had that aqueous chlorine solution, and we were like, oh, this is a nonpolar compound. It shouldn't dissolve in water, ideally. But we can think about the intermolecular forces, the fact that chlorine has surface area. And just saying doesn't dissolve in water or does dissolve in water is not enough detail. It's like very slightly soluble. A little bit can be dissolved in water. We have to do special things to force it to do that. Um, and that's why we have to keep putting chlorine into pools. Well, also, we don't, we don't just bubble chlorine gas in there. We put different chemicals in that decompose. But um, you know, if, you, if you bubble chlorine gas through water, some of it will dissolve in water. And we looked at this in terms of Cl2, O2, N2. You all know anyone into scuba diving? Anyone have any experience with scuba diving at all? Has anyone ever heard of the bends? OK, one of you. So it turns out scuba diving has this really interesting phenomena where when you go deep underwater, um, the N2 that you, you're breathing, essentially, the nitrogen gas, um, can get pressurized into your bloodstream and into other parts of your body where it's not supposed to be. Um, and if you come back up too fast, the bubbles expand and get stuck in places, particularly in joints. And it makes your fingers, you know, and you got to go through a depressurization chamber. It's a whole process. So they figured this out, and the, the solution is there's a certain rate at which you can rise, and you have to wait there for the N2. The N2 bubbles can get bigger, and then your body will kind of, like, you know, the, your body will, like, flush it out slowly. Um, so there's a certain rate at how fast you can go back up. Because N2 is soluble in blood, it's soluble in water, it's in, it's in the water just like O2 is. So these things that we would, uh, and just give you your midterms back. The whole like nonpolar versus polar thing, not enough detail, right? There's so much more to it. We can't just look at this and say, Cl2 is nonpolar, so it won't dissolve in water. We know it dissolves in water. We see it dissolve in water. O2 is nonpolar, so it doesn't dissolve in water. We know it dissolves in water. Fish breathe oxygen out of the water. So it's like, no, there's more details to it. It's these, uh, this idea of intermolecular forces, not just soluble, insoluble, but how soluble is it? And the reason we have to think about all that is covalent compound versus ionic compound. I've, I've spent this quarter more than quarters in the past because I've realized how important it is to be able to recognize covalent versus ionic. That kind of recognition is really important for figuring out a lot. That, that's usually for a lot of things we do. That's the first step in the process of, well, is it covalent or ionic? It's covalent. It'll have these interactions. If it's covalent, it'll get this naming style. If it's covalent, it might have these types of reactions. If it's ionic, it gets a whole different set of things. So recognizing that it's ionic compounds versus covalent compounds becomes really important. 
Good question. Yeah, so this is this is this is one that you can answer very quickly on LabPal. Very easy to Google these two reactions and get it. Very easy. I chat GPT would probably tell you the answers. But getting the explanation for why these are like the, the thing that I've been trying, the other thing I've been trying to stress more this quarter is getting the questions right is only the first step. Sure, that gets you the points and everything, but you have to go back and be like, okay. Not only why did I get it right, but why are these two questions next to each other, right? This thing by itself is less meaningful than when it's these two together and you can do that compare contrast, right? That comparison idea of like, why are these two things next to each other? What's the broader lesson that's trying to be taught here? That is kind of that next level thinking that we want to be aiming for. And I put it on the exams as I'm sure you see. So that's number 11. Uh, nah, no, I'm not going to. So there are things I change. I don't do this exact same exams every quarter. Like I change things. It usually has similar forms. This, this one used to be, so I shouldn't put this on the video. Hang on a second. <laughs> OK, so let's go ahead and look at number 12. It's going to be weird for the people who watch the video and it's like, wait, what did he say? It's a secret, sorry. Um. Write a balanced reaction for solid calcium carbonate with um, a solution of hydrochloric acid. Now, there's a couple different ways that this might accept it. Um, and the thing that I think is going to be interesting is what they want for states of matter. Because there's two different ways that we could think about it. First off, um, let's just do this. It's going to be calcium carbonate. We won't worry about the state of matter yet. With HCl. And we have to predict products. This is going to be an acid-base reaction. Um, but it turns out it's still a flip-flop as well, right? It's a double displacement. So I'm going to take my positive thing, move it where my other positive thing is, take this positive thing, move it where that positive thing is, right? Displace both things, flip-flop. So that's going to get me HCO3 plus CaCl. Now, before I do anything else, I have to make sure that my products are charge balanced. These aren't good products yet. I just moved my cations around. And I know that my calcium is a plus 2. And I know my hydrogen is plus 1. I know carbonate is a minus 2. And I know chloride is a minus 1. So right now, these things are not charge balanced. All right, I've got plus 1 and minus 2. How do I balance that out? H subscript 2. Two hydrogens attached to that. How do I charge balance this one? Two chlorines attached to that calcium. Great, so that's charge balanced. If I look up my solubility rules, this is going to be aqueous. This is going to be aqueous. This is going to be aqueous. This one, and this is where I'm like, ooh. Um, Right? Some people will list this as aqueous, some people will list it as solid. I would tend to list this as aqueous in the reaction. Because when we're tapping solid in there, it's kind of like the limiting reactants lab, where like the two solids were mixed, but the reaction didn't actually happen until we dissolved it in water and it went to aqueous state. So when we're writing our balanced chemical reaction, we often put it in the state where the reaction is actually occurring, not the state of the material we're dumping in. So is that not like something you could find just on your like solubility rules? Like you can't just look at. CA. You can, right? So the part that I find confusing is that the problem said specifically, you're mixing solid calcium carbonate with aqueous hydrochloric acid. So the way the problem is written, it might want you to call this solid. But the way I would write it is where the reaction is happening. So the solubility rules would say this is going to be aqueous. Okay. Now, this. If I balance this now, two, done. But not actually done. What's wrong with this problem? Do we have to have a water product? Yes, and where's that water product going to come from? Do you all see the thing that's not a thing? So when we're making our, when we're predicting our products, we need to, we do the flip flop thing. Then we make sure they're charge balanced. Then we make sure they're stable. Is one of my compounds unstable? H2H2O3. 
Yeah, this thing. That thing is unstable and will break apart into H2O liquid. So you were right to be looking for water. Um, but it's why is there water? Right? And so that carbonic acid, um, this is actually, if you didn't know this, um, this is kind of in all of your soda. So this is, this is how, do you, how do you make carbonic acid stick around? Put it under pressure. Two liter bottle, put a cap on. You essentially, like, you know how it's like, if you, if you shake it up a bunch, it gets like super pressurized. But if you keep shaking it, you don't see any more bubbles. It's all of the CO2 converts into carbonic acid under pressure. So that's one of the special cases you could do to force carbonic <laughs> acid to exist is put it under high pressure, high CO2 pressure. Then as soon as you open it up, first off, it shoots a fountain out at the top because like, you know, all the CO2 is escaping. But essentially what you're seeing, the reason that's such a, a violent reaction is you're seeing this high concentration of carbonic acid all start to decompose at the same time. And it just creates this huge amount of CO2 gas all at once. So that's why shaking a two liter bottle will make it shoot out the top is because you're forcing carbonic acid to exist when it's not stable. So as soon as you remove that condition of it, like to, to make it exist, it starts decomposing. Mm -hmm. And at higher concentrations, the reaction is typically faster. Other thing you could do is if you just leave the cap off your uh, off your two liters bottle of soda, goes flat. All your carbonic acid disappears. All the CO2 escapes. It all decomposes. Now your soda's flat. Um, now we can go ahead and say this is going to be our balanced chemical reaction. So I'm going to replace that H2CO3. I just wanted to give myself a little bit more space here. Move this over this way a little bit. So we're going to have our H2O liquid plus our CO2 gas plus our CaCl2 aqueous. And that's going to come from our CaCO3 CO aqueous plus our 2 HCl aqueous. And that should be the balanced chemical reaction. Balancing is not that hard. The main thing to recognize is that we have that carbonic acid that's an unstable product that we need to deal with. So how do we know it's unstable? It's just a... It's a thing that um, we should remember. For, for now, we remember, right? There's, there's other energy... Are you taking Chemo 28? Mm -hmm. Eventually, we'll get into the energetics of how we can predict whether something is stable or unstable in different states of matter using enthalpy and entropy. Not doing it this quarter. Right. This is the one that I wrote on the board before the types of reactions lab because I was like, hey, this is a really important thing to remember. It's the first problem we do, and I know everyone in class is going to ask me about it unless I write it on the board. I wrote it on the board. Only about a third of the class asked me about it. And I was like, it's the thing I wrote on the board that I said everyone's going to ask me about. It was okay. Um, both my classes did. It kind of makes me giggle a little bit. The one that really got me yesterday. Um, six to nine class didn't do it as bad. Sorry, three to six people throw you under the bus. But um, there was the, um, oh, uh, well, we'll see. Maybe the six to nine people will ask about it later. But it is um, when I pointed out the correct molecular weight for the limiting reactants lab. And I made you all open up the page and like look at the number. And I was like, I don't want to answer like this question a, a dozen times. I did that in my other class, and I still answered the question like a dozen times. And like, there were several people who, like, as they were asking me, they were like, is this the thing you said? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> makes me smile. Uh, makes me giggle. And, yeah. Better than getting frustrated, right? Um, so that's number 12, which is all of the questions we had on 7.2, unless someone, anyone, 7.2? Yeah. 27, I think. On 7.2? You have it handy? Yes. Is it 27? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, the first one was SO3 2 minus, and then the second one was. 
Yeah. Is there another, or is it just those two? It was just those two. Okay. So, now, we clearly need to assign sulfur and nitrogen, because all of the oxygens are going to be minus twos. Now, I've got three minus twos, two, one of them is going to be there, so sulfur is going to be a plus four. Right? So I've got minus six, four minus six would be minus two. Right? We can kind of do it, in, do it in our head. If you want to see the longer math way to do it, it's going to be the sulfur oxidation number times one plus the oxygen oxidation number times three is equal to minus two. And then just, we know oxygen is going to be equal to minus two. So plug that minus two in itself. Right? Sometimes seeing the equation helps people. Sometimes seeing the equation makes it more complicated than it needs to be. Because you can kind of just do like 3 times minus 2 is 6. 4 plus 4 minus 6 is minus 2. So it works out. So we can get our sulfur is a plus 4. Was that OK? Too fast? Too slow? That was good. That was good. OK. Now let's go ahead and do it for N2O4. We're going to have nitrogen's oxidation number times 2 plus oxygen's oxidation number times 4 is equal to 0, right? I've got no charge left over, right? I had a 2 minus here. That's why it was equal to minus 2. I've got no charge here. That's going to be 8 plus 4, right? So I'm going to have, again, I know oxygen is a minus 2 most of the time. Weird. There's some weird situations where it's not. Most of the time it's that. So that's going to be minus 8. That's going to be plus 8 plus 8 divided by 2. Nitrogen is also in the plus 4 oxidation state. Most of the time, when oxygen is attached to something, yeah, like 95% of the time, 99% of the time, oxygen attached to something, the something it's attached to has a positive oxidation state. Because... Oxygen is the most electronegative thing besides fluorine. Yeah. Well, my other question, like when you're giving an answer for this, because there's two nitrogens, mm -hmm. would you do like n equals two, or would it be n equals positive four? Uh, depends on the way that it's asking the question. So I'm a little confused with that on the camera, like on the. Laptop. My guess is plus four, right? Plus four. Is asking for the oxidation state of each nitrogen okay. in the compound. There's very few. I don't. I don't think I intentionally ask like total oxidation state. It's usually each oxidation each state. Okay. Each oxygen's a minus two. Each nitrogen's a plus four. Okay. I think it might have, like, put it wrong, right? Yeah. Nah. That's my point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other things on some point two? Then let's go. Let's shift to talking about stoichiometry, starting with the limiting reactant prep activity. So if I remember correctly, there are two limiting reactant prep activities. One was just doing kind of like calculations, and the other was that really long assignment that had like part six, seven, eight, where it does that really weird flip that I warned you about in class, where it switches from talking about the molecular state of like the molecular scale of reactions, and then it just suddenly switches to moles. And it really throws a lot of people off because you can't have a fraction of a molecule because that would be like cut an oxygen atom in half. It's not an oxygen anymore. But you can have a fraction of a mole. Because a mole is trillions and trillions and trillions of molecules. You can have half of a trillion, trillion, trillion molecules. You can have half of a trillion molecules. You can have like a, you know, like you can have a hundredth of a trillion molecules. You can have a fraction of a mole, but you can't have a fraction of a molecule. So that made that transition, in my opinion, and I think I've, I, I, I want to add like more notes in there to like make it more obvious when that change is happening. But I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Um, towards the end, is it the end of the first one or the end of the second one? Do you have a question? Um, it's the end of the first one. Okay. Really so towards the end of the first one, there's a question. And the question is? Sorry. It's a long question, isn't it? Question. Go for it. You are given 6.51 grams of an unknown mixture of ethane gas and oxygen. Well, hold on. 6.51? Yes. Ethane with oxygen? Yes. Okay. 
After burning the unknown mixture in a sealed container, you recover 1.18 grams of water, as well as carbon dioxide and ethane gas. 1.18 mm -hmm. grams water? And ethane and carbon dioxide? Yes. Okay. So, it's, what was the mass of oxygen gas, what was the mass of ethane gas, and what was the mass percent of oxygen gas? Ethane? Okay. Notice the percent mass of? Oxygen gas. Okay. Easy peasy, right? Now, this is kind of a weird question. Now, once we start breaking down this question, it's actually not that weird. But the way it's asking it is in such a way that it's like you actually have to be, a lot of the times when we're doing stoichiometry, especially in this assignment, it's like crunch the numbers, follow the algorithm, crunch the numbers. This problem is set up in such a way that you actually have to think about what's going on in order to like, get to the math that you need to do, which I like those types of problems, as you know. So um, this could be like um, ethane gases, you know, ethane, methane. Um, it's not acetylene. That's what I was thinking of originally. But, um, this is a combustion reaction, right? We're burning. We're bur we've got a fuel. We're burning it with oxygen. We're going to produce water and carbon dioxide. So we can go ahead and write down that chemical reaction. So we're going to do this like stoichiometry. We're going to go through our four steps. Step one. What's the balanced chemical reaction? Step two, what amount of material do we start with? We can't figure that out. Step three, what's the limiting reactant? Let's we'll see if we can figure that out. Step four, how much product is made? So we're going to start with just writing the balanced chemical reaction, C2H6 plus gas plus O2 gas goes to CO2 gas plus H2O gas. Uh, balancing is going to be three. Oh no, not a three. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Two, four, six, and that's going to be three plus four is going to be seven. Um, there's some tricks to balancing that we can talk about. I noticed that I had um, an odd number of oxygens here, but an even number of oxygens here, so I wanted to make that work out. Um, I think I balanced that correctly. Does that look good? I got four carbons, four carbons, 12 hydrogens, 12 hydrogens, 14, and then 8 plus 6 is 14, so I'm looking good. Now, um, the problem is here, I'm going to do this in the weird way that I like to organize things, where I'm going to do like my start, my react, and my end, which I showed you all at the end of class yesterday. The problem is, I'm going to start with an unknown amount here, and an unknown amount here. We'll call this question mark, let's call this question mark ethane, and question mark oxygen. I don't know what those are. But I've got those two things. I know that they add up to 6.51, but I don't know how much of each one there is. I'm not starting with any CO2. I'm not starting with any H2O. Now, during the reaction, I'm going to lose some amount of limiting reactant from all of these. I'm going to gain some amount of limiting reactant to all of these times the mole ratio. Now, I don't know what the mole ratio is because I don't know what the limiting reactant is yet. But I'm going to have to have, let me give myself a little more space there, times mole ratio, minus limiting reactant, times mole ratio, plus limiting reactant times mole ratio, plus limiting reactant times mole ratio. And at the end of each of these, I'm going to get some moles of H2O, which I can figure out because it told me I'm in the mass of H2O. I'm going to have some moles of CO2, which I can probably figure out by relating these two things to each other, right? If I can, if I can find this number, if I can find 
If I can figure out this number, I can use it to figure out that number. Because they're both 0 plus the same thing, essentially. So that's looking hopeful. Right? I'm just doing the thinking part of this right now. Then comes the important part, right? So right now, I, I feel like we're pretty stuck because we don't know what the limiting reaction is. Finding the amount of H2O isn't helpful if I don't, I could find the moles of CO2, but if I don't know the limiting reactant, I'm going to feel a little bit stuck if I don't know which compound it is. So is there some way that I can figure out what the limiting reactant is? It's a really subtle thing in the problem. If you don't notice it, you're just like, no way to figure it out. But if you notice it, you're just like, oh, that's what that is. What do we have left after we burn our, our mixture? We have ethane gas left over. Do we have O2 gas left over? No, the fact that they told us there was ethane left over means that this thing is, we're going to have moles of C2H6 left over, and we're going to have zero O2 left over. Okay, so that one little detail, the fact that they say ethane gas is collected after the reaction, tells us, oh, ethane gas is excess, our O2 gas is limiting. Which means now, every amount of oxygen here is coming from the O2 here. So I can make this relationship between these two things. I know now, I'm going to change some labeling. I'm going to pick a different color. That means I can erase this limiting reactant bit here, and I can put moles of O2. I can erase the limiting reactant bit here. I can do minus moles of O2. I can do minus moles of O2. I can erase the limiting reactant bit here. I can put plus moles of O2, and I can erase the limiting reactant bit here, and I can do plus moles of O2. Now, because because I can figure out the mole ratio between each thing in oxygen now, I can also make this my moles of O2. And this one I'm going to leave out as a question mark because I don't want to write moles of C2H6 twice. Um, right? Because I, they gave me the, the water bit here, I can figure out how many moles of O2 I have. I can take this chunk, and I can do a calculation like we did on the board last time. I can do um, 0 plus moles of O2 times, I'm going to plug in my mole ratio for H2O to O2, which number is going to go on bottom? The, limit, the coefficient of the limiting reactant goes on bottom. Coefficient of water goes on top. That's going to be equal to my moles of H2O, which I can find because I've got the grams. My moles of H2O, I don't want to do this in too many steps at once. So I'm going to have this thing. I'm going to have my 1.18 grams times 1 mole for 18 grams. And that is going to get me my moles of H2O. So notice, in this equation down here, I've got 0 plus. The one thing I don't know is how many moles of O2 I have. So because they gave us the exact amount of H2O they made, and they told us ethane was excess by saying it was still around at the end of the reaction, then we can say, okay, well, I can use my, molecular, I can use my mass of water and my molecular weight of water to find the moles of water that were produced. I can use the moles of water, since it all came from the oxygen with some mole ratio, I can use that to figure out how many moles of oxygen must have been present through the whole reaction. And after you have that, then you can do, then you can figure out, ooh, let's see. Oh, you can do the percent by mass. Once you have the moles of oxygen, you can get the grams of oxygen. Our original sample is either oxygen or ethane. So if we've got the amount that's oxygen, the rest of it must be ethane. So figuring out, and so the real, the real trick here for me, the thing that was tricky was, one, realizing that ethane is excess, <laughs> oxygen is limiting, and it's just like one word in the entire problem tells you that, <coughs> which is why I say it's kind of a subtle thing. 
And then after you realize FAME is limiting, or after you realize O2 is limiting FAME is excess, realizing that you can use your H2O that's produced to find the amount of O2 that must have reacted. I'm waiting for that concept to set, set in before we do all of the math for it. Question? Why is it just eight small grams? Would it be 1.10? It seems like oh, 1.18 divided by 18. 18 is the molecular weight of water. Does that make sense? Great. Now, the reason I'm waiting for this to conceptually set in is because this is the same thing you have to do in the actual lab. We know how much product we made. We know what the limiting reactant is. We can calculate backwards from that. Question? Um, I have a question in doing the math. Uh -huh. I remember like, when I was in class, yesterday in class. Yeah, I, so would you divide, like, would you divide first or would you multiply the top first? Which part? Um, like... Here? here? Yeah, like here. Would you like multiply it or no. divide first? Or? Um, that In that case, it's okay. Multiply and divide can be done kind of in either order. It's yeah. just you have to be careful about the multiply with the addition. Okay. And that's what a lot of people in class were messing up so yesterday. Do you add first or do you, do you do multiply? First? You know, you just multiply and divide before you add or subtract. Okay. Other questions before I flip the board and we do the math for this one? Good question. Wait, who asked this one? Was he? Oh, it was you. Good question, by the way. Okay, let's flip the board and do the math. Give myself a little bit more space so I don't hit the wall too much while I'm flipping the board back and forth. Okay, so the math that we have is um, 1.18 grams of H2O times. One mole of H2O has 18 grams of H2O. So we're using our molecular weight. We're, we're multiplying by one over the molecular weight. It's more or less on the screen, right? <coughs> Close enough. Right, that will get us how many moles of water we have. Got the calculator, 1.18 divided by 18, 0 0.0655. Right, so we know how many moles of H2O. They told us how many grams of H2O there were. And we can get the molecular weight for H2O from the periodic table. I just use it so often that I, I know it. Um, now we can go ahead and say, oh, there's the other part we know, which is the moles of O2, our limiting reactant, times our, our mole ratio, which was 6 moles of uh, H2O per 7 moles of O2 is going to be equal to that same number. It's equal to 0 0.0655 moles H2O. I'm going to multiply the 7, 6 rate. I've got a plus 0 over here, but it's plus 0, so I just kind of forget about it. I'm going to multiply by the 7, divide by the 6. I'm going to get my moles of O2 is equal to 0 0.0655 times 7 sixths. That's going to get me my moles of O2, 0 0.06. Must be 0 0.0764 moles of O2. So that's how many moles of O2 we have in the chemical reaction. I don't remember what the, the problem asked. I think it asked for like mass of O2, percent mass of O2. Right, so the next thing I want to do, because I'm going to flip the board to remind us of this. Um, because we've got the mixture in grams, we don't have like the moles of each thing, I'm going to convert this moles of O2 back to grams of O2 so I can relate it to this beginning. So I take my 0 0.0764 moles of O2. This was like step one is this. This is like step two. I'm going to multiply by um, 32 grams of O2, one mole of O2, 
right? And we're often multiplying or dividing by molecular weight. When we're going from um, <clears throat> grams to moles, we divide. When we're going from moles to grams, we multiply. And we're usually just doing that, one or the other, one or the other. Um, so we take our 0 0.0764, 0 0.0764 times 32, and we get 2.445, eh, close enough, grams of O2. Step three is the realization that I have, is it 6.51? I can't remember the number now. Uh, 6.51 grams equals my mass of O2 plus my mass of ethane. Where I now know my mass of O2, right? Because we had that amount of O2 as our limiting reactant, all of the O2 that was in the reaction must have been all of the O2 we had at the beginning. Right? Look at this in the stoichiometry. This amount of O2 at the beginning completely gets used up, goes all the way to zero. So the amount of O2 that we end up with reacting must be all of the O2 that we had. So I can go ahead and say 6.51 is equal to 2.445 plus whatever that mass of ethane is. That's a pretty easy subtraction to do. We get our mass of ethane, making sure, I gotta be more careful when I'm drawing my M's, making sure these are lowercase M's, not capital M's. Um, 4.065 grams for my ethane, right? And if I add those two numbers together, I get my total amount. So now I've figured out my mass of ethane. If I wanted to, now that I have my grams of ethane, I could figure out my moles of ethane, and I could figure out the moles of excess ethane and the grams of excess ethane, but there's nothing in the problem that asks us to do that. We could do it for fun, um, but we probably want to answer some other questions while we're at it. Hey, come on in. So it's like I found the moles and mass of O2 that way, but I tried to do it the same way for ethane gas, and it didn't do it. Oh, yeah, so it's recognizing that the total masses add together. But so like why doesn't that work? So the reason that doesn't work is because we don't know how much ethane we started with. We don't know how much excess ethane there is. So if you do it the same way, it would only work the same way if we said, and all the ethane, we would need to know this value here. So the reason it worked for oxygen was because we knew the oxygen went to zero. We knew it ran out. Um, can't do it for ethane because ethane doesn't go to zero. It goes to some non-zero value. Yeah, scooch in um, backpacks like under desks, under chairs. Um, pull out more chairs. You can see you can sit on you can sit on the floor if you're comfortable with that, or you can unfold the other chair, just plop it down in front of everybody. That's okay too. I like it. There should be space back there for you. <laughs> so yeah, since we don't know this number, this whole like adding it together doesn't work because we don't know. Right? This this one worked for this worked because we had a zero someplace. We had a zero someplace. We had a zero someplace. This one, no zeros. So we have to use this kind of, we have to use this total mass we began with. And this kind of step three of like, oh, if I know the moles of oxygen, I can get the grams of oxygen. Since I know the total grams, I can subtract those two numbers to get the, mole, the grams of ethane. And then I can get from grams of ethane to moles of ethane. It doesn't ask us to do moles of ethane. What it asks us to do is it asks us to find the percent mass of oxygen, which is a fancy way of saying make a fraction, 2.445 divided by 6.51 times 100, right? Grams of oxygen divided by total grams times 100, that's the percentage by mass of oxygen. We could have done the same thing. We could have done ethane divided by the total, and we could have gotten the percentage of ethane. But it's specific, the problem specifically asks for the percentage of oxygen gas by weight. 
There's a couple different ways. We're not really going to see a lot of problems. We'll see a few more problems where we do percent by weight. Um, sometimes you see percent by volume. Like in future classes, you might see percent by volume. You might see percent by mass. You might see percent by mole. Um, given what most of you are giving, where most of your careers are going, percent volume, percent mass is what you usually see. A lot of times you see percent mass instead of percent volume because it's easier to measure the mass than the volume, right? If you want to measure the volume of something, like especially for like industrial things, if you want to measure the volume of something that's like 500 liters, you need a 500 liter graduated cylinder. It's like massive. Whereas like you just need a scale and you can measure the weight of it. It still has to be a pretty big scale, but like making big scales is easier than making big like volume containers. Questions. Now, this was a good problem to look at for a couple reasons. One, it was in the limiting reactants activity, um, but it really does also touch onto a lot of the ideas of stoichiometry. Um, this one, we didn't have to do any calculations to determine the limiting reactant. We had to recognize that we had something left over at the end. And that's what told us that what the limiting react, what the limiting was, and what the excess was. Um, this does a lot of this kind of like conceptual work for how many moles are produced, how we relate the moles produced back and forth between different things as needed, uh, and very importantly, it's also very very similar to the calculation you're going to need to do to finish the limiting reactants lab where you know how much solid you made, and you know what the limiting reactant is, so you have to relate that back to the amount of that limiting reactant in your sample, where you know the total mass of your sample. This calculation falls almost exactly with what you have to do to finish the limiting reactant lab, which is really nice. Questions about this problem? Let's find, do me a favor, look through other problems, and let's find another. I want to do a little bit more stoichiometry practice. Do you have a problem? There's the one before this problem, but it's asking for how many grams of water will be produced from the combustion of ethylene gas and oxygen gas. Does it give you the amount of ethylene yeah, and oxygen? Yeah, Okay, so that's the simpler version of this. Okay, is that just like the going... Start yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just start to end. Let's still do it together, yeah? Okay. You want to still want to see it together? Sure. Okay, let's still do it together. But yeah, so this was, we, we went to the harder version first. So let's go ahead. What number is that on the limiting reactant prep? Uh, part X. So this was part XI. XI. We're going to go back and do part, do you know the X is for 10? It's okay. Roman numeral? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we're going to go back and we're going to do part 10. Ready? Okay, I'm going to erase this. Here we go. <laughs> Erasing whiteboards and chalkboards is um, a funny thing to me. Thanks, Dr. Stuchar Burkoff. <laughs> Long story. We'll get into it after we do this problem, if you're curious. Okay, so this is a similar problem. So, like, Clear your brains out a little bit. It's going to look really similar. And we want to be careful that we're not thinking about the problem we just did. OK, so this one. But it's, um, how many grams of water will be produced from the combustion of 8.29 grams of ethane gas with 16 grams of oxygen gas? And then it asks how many grams of the excess reactant remain after the reaction is Okay, so this one is more like the practice we were doing yesterday in class and, and more like the titration lab, right? And I actually, so the reason that I didn't push us to do everything with the limiting reactants lab first is because I actually think the limiting reactants calculations are harder than the, like the, the titration calculations are actually easier than the limiting reactant calculations. Um, but we're still going to finish both by the end of the week. 
So here, we're going to end up with the same chemical reaction. Can I remember my balancing now? 2C2H6 gas plus 7O2 gas goes to 4CO2 gas plus 6H2O gas. Okay, so here's our balanced chemical reaction. We know how much ethane and oxygen we're starting with. <coughs> right, I'm going to have, can I just call it 8.3 grams? That's close enough, right? And 16 grams here. The calculation to get these to moles is I'm going to multiply by 132nd. This one I have to do a little bit of a calculation to get the molecular weight of ethane. It's going to be 12 times 2 plus 6. Actually, I should be able to do that in my head. 12 times 2 is 24 plus 6. That's going to be 30. Right? That will get me my moles that I'm going to start with in each case. And also, I am doing it in the table way because I love the table way. But if you need me to slow it down, we can slow it down. 8.3 divided by 30 is 0.276 moles of ethane. 16, oops, whoa. And then we got 0.5 moles of O2. Which one's limiting? The bigger number or the smaller number? Warning before you answer, I'm asking this in a way that is a trick. Which one's the which one's the limiting reactant? The bigger number or the smaller number? Depends how many of these. Depends on the ratio, right? So it's it's fine to think, oh, the smaller number is probably limiting, but look at the ratio. I need less of the smaller number. I only need two moles of C2H6. I need almost triple O2 in order for O2 to be excess, right? I need three times more. Looking at this, right, the mole ratio is going to suggest that um, actually I think O2 is limiting. I'm going to show you real quick during office hours here, I'm going to show you the third way to do. So the way we've been doing, we've been doing the second way which is moles of possible product. I'm going to show you the third way, which is actually my favorite way to conceptually think about it, um, which is moles of reaction for figuring out our limiting reactant. And when we get good at it and we understand what's happening conceptually, um, I find this one easier to do. So I'm going to figure out moles of reaction. How many times can the reaction happen? If I've got 0.276 moles, of C2H6, every one reaction that happens is going to use two moles of C2H6. Right, so I just take my moles, divide by its coefficient. It's going to be like 0.15 something, 0.276, 1 1.38, sorry, 0.138. So from that ethane, I could do 0.138 moles of reaction. There's a certain number of times the reaction can happen. From my oxygen, from my 0.5 moles of O2, every one reaction that happens uses 7 moles of O2. Right? I'm just dividing my moles by the coefficient, and that's going to be 0.5 divided by 7, and that's going to be 0.0714 reactions. Technically, moles are reactions. I'm just being a little bit lazy. <coughs> Which one can do less reactions? Oxygen. Which one's limiting? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? So again, it's not just it's not just the number of moles. It's the moles with the mole ratio. I like this one because in my head, it's easy to do 2 divided by 0.27. That's going to be like 0.14-ish. And then I can do 0.5 divided by 7. I can't do that one in my head because dividing by 7 is weird. Um, but it should be about 0.07, actually, because 0.5 is like almost 0.49, which would be like 7 times 7. So we get 0.07, less reactions. That means our O2, in this situation, the bigger number of moles, 
ends up being the limiting reactant because of the mole ratio. Now, after we have that starting amount, we start with zero CO2, we start with zero H2O. I'm going to do my quick reaction step. Right, so now, and this is the real reason I like doing this table method. It breaks up the way I'm thinking about the math in terms of what's actually chemically happening. Rather than being like, well, what's happening to O2 as if it's separate from what's happening to ethane? It's like, well, what do we start with? How do all things react together? So as this reaction proceeds, we're going to see the, the number of times the reaction can happen is going to be 0.5 divided by 7. The number of times the reaction can happen is going to be 0.5 divided by 7. The number of times the reaction happens is going to be 0.5 divided by 7. The number of times the reaction can happen is going to be 0.5 divided by 7. Every time the reaction happens, I use 2 moles of ethane. Every time the reaction happens, I use 7 moles of O2. Every time the reaction happens, I, use, I produce 4 moles of CO2. And every time the reaction happens, I produce 6 moles of H2O. So that react line is thinking about how all of the different reactions <coughs> and products interact with each other to get us where we end up with in the reaction, right? It's not like I'm thinking about O2 by itself. The O2 is reacting with the C2H6. As those two things react, I make these other products. Right? They're all connected to each other in the reaction. And then I can just do my math down each column. Um, I'm going to do the product side easier because it's a little bit e <laughs> it's easier. This is going to be like 0.28. This is going to be like 0.32. Uh, this one, of course, is going to be 0 because it's my limiting reactant. That one I can do pretty easy. 0.5 times uh, 0.5 divided by 7. Ooh, 0.5 divided by 7. There we go, times 4. 0.2857. Now, notice in doing the table method, I kind of answered questions that the problem didn't even ask. Did the problem ask me how much CO2 was made? Right, it just wanted to know about the H2O. But in the table method, I'm just doing everything at once. Right, it's all happening. It's just like it all happens. It's all it's all connected. Right, you can't make any H2O without making CO2 as well. Might as well calculate them both and see how they relate to each other. Uh, and then the last thing is calculating this amount here. 0.276 minus. Point one three three moles excess. Questions about any of those steps before we do the last thing for this problem? Right. So I like the table method for the organizational aspect of it, right? On my react step, it's always minus limiting reactant moles times each mole ratio, right? Limiting reactant divided by its coefficient, limiting reactant divided by its coefficient, limiting reactant divided by its coefficient, right? You write the same thing over and over again. And that makes sense because that's the thing that's controlling how much the reaction happens. And I just find it really easy to do like all four calculations rather than doing like this one and thinking about each thing and then this one and thinking about each thing. Like the react steps are the same for all of them. So I can just like write them all down real quick. The only thing that changes is the coefficient on top for each one. That's all that changes. So I really like that for those organizational purposes. Yeah? And like everything that you found on the bottom is the excess for each? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I call it the ending spot right now. Um, you can call it the, it is excess, right? It's the excess amounts. Um, and excess is probably a better thing to call it. I'm going to put ending co quotes right here. Because um, we're going to learn in future quarters that it's like, Maybe not really the end, but close enough. Especially for this reaction, close enough. And what I mean by close enough is there might be like 1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of O2 left over. There might be like, it's like approximately 0. There might be 0. 0.00000001 mole.
souls left over, which for us doesn't matter right now. But if it was lead, that's still enough to poison you. So sometimes it matters. Okay, last step in the problem. We ready? Now, it didn't ask us to find the number of moles. It asked us to find the number of grams. So the last thing we need to do is take that point 0.429 moles of H2O, 0.429 moles H2O, multiply by 18 grams per mole. Seven point seven two grams H two O. Again, you notice I like to put labels on the grams because there's going to be grams of three different things here. We also have to be careful. I'm going to I'm going to point out why we have to be careful here, and I'm actually going to go ahead and put an extra label on this. Doesn't matter for the water. That's grams of H two O produced. It's going to matter for the ethane here. 0.133 moles. C2H6 times 30 grams per mole, um, 3.99, yeah, 3.99 grams C2H6. Now, why is it bad to label that as just grams of C2H6? Was it the grams I started with or the grams I ended up with? Right, there's two places where we've got grams of C2H6. And this is a really common problem. It's not going to be so bad this quarter, but how many of you are taking Chem 129? I don't know, a couple of you, right? Um, this is a really big issue in Chem 129. It's, it's, it's a little bit of an issue this quarter, where it's easy to lose track of whether we're talking about moles at the end or moles at the start. Right? Keeping track of whether it's moles at the end or moles at the start is actually really important. Um, same thing here with our grams. If I just say there's 3.99 grams of C2H6, well, we already said we started with 8. That's our excess. So this is, we like to label this as 3.99 grams C2H6. And I actually like to put the label that it's excess. You can see why I didn't really think of that as an issue with the water, because there's only one place where we have grams of water. But when you have multiple grams in multiple places, it's nice to label whether it's the beginning or the end. Feeling good about stoichiometry? Better? OK, now if you haven't noticed, if you're like, I'm feeling good about it, but I don't know if I really feel good about it, there are worksheets posted to LabPal. And there's stoichiometry practice one, stoichiometry practice two, stoichiometry practice three. And they're just extra worksheets. They've got like the steps for doing stoichiometry listed at the top. And um, you can just go and they're, they're, I think they're great stoichiometry practice. I might print some of those problems and bring them to one of the classes if we got time, like next week. But next week's the last week of class. Is that weird to anyone? Yeah. It's weird. Um, will stoich be like a large part of the final? Um, Yes-ish, maybe. Now, why might Stoic be a large part of the final? We're yeah, learning we covered this in it. our last like, two weeks. We're learning it in our last two weeks. What was yours? Well, we haven't covered it in a test before. We haven't covered it in a test before. It's a good representative of like, the math stuff. And, like, the That's stuff. the reason I like yeah. it. It's a good representative of all the different things we've been doing, right? We need to understand like how we predict chemical reactions, how we balance chemical reactions, what type of chemical reactions there are, how we use unit analysis to get from grams to moles and moles to grams, and then thinking about how chemicals are actually rearranging on the atomic scale to make new products. Right? All of the, the reason it took us so long to get to stoichiometry, even though like high school classes will do stoichiometry where it's like, this is the process, memorize it. And the reason it takes us so long to get to stoichiometry is because we're really trying to get it to where it's like, when you're doing stoichiometry, you can think about all of these other aspects that are influencing the stoichiometry. Why does this reaction happen? Well, oxygen is a good reducing agent. It's really electronegative, and so it can pull C2-6H apart and oxidize and reduce. You can look at the oxidation numbers of things, and we can talk about the amounts. Right? So it pulls all of these different ideas together. 
and that's that's why it might be a little bit more represented. It's our last, it's our my only chance to test you on it, and also it pulls together a lot of ideas from throughout the quarter, all into like a single problem, which I love it when that happens. Question here and then there. Is the final like like the same for all Chem One Twenty Seven? Not exactly. Students or different for the class? It's it's going to be different for our class. There's there's um, there's some things we do in the same ways, so that way there's like some comparability between the different sections. Um, like for example, the the formatting I really like on my exams where I split up because I have to tell you, I never liked it when I took multiple choice tests and it was like the easy problems and the hard problems were all right next to each other. It always bothered me because I could like I was like. Especially when they're all worth the same amount. I'm like, why would I spend 10 minutes on this problem when I can do this one in like a minute and it's worth the same amount? So like when I was taking, there were classes where when I would take multiple choice tests, I would just skip problems. I'd be like, that takes too long, forget it. It's only worth, it's like this worth the same amount as this, forget it. So on my tests, I like to do this separation of like, here are the easy ones, they're worth less points, here are the hard ones, they're worth more points. So you know where you need to spend more time and less time. Uh, but to create some similarity across the different sections, I've been asked to do it through the same format as the other classes, where it's just all the multiple choice questions like in one go, not splitting them up. It's fine. It's fine. Is the final just going to be all in person? All in person for the final. No, no online portion. And then will it be more multiple choice than the midterm or less? Or a little bit more multiple choice. Um, yeah, quite a bit more multiple choice, right? It's a three hour exam. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a three-hour exam, three-hour finals. So, um, more multiple choice, maybe a little extra more multiple choice just because, and that's just because it's winter quarter. Um, my time frame for getting it graded, getting grades submitted, and then prepping for next quarter, that's my whole spring break. Like, I don't actually get, like, my week off is, like, grades need to be submitted by, like, Tuesday at noon. And then I have to have my classes ready to go by Monday. Like I actually need them ready to go by that Friday so I can send emails out for my Monday classes. So like my entire spring break is working. It's kind of a bummer. Um, question here and then over here? No, it's also about the multiple choice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, question. So would it be like rap prompt questions on the final? Like similar or like Similar, but it's all in person, right? So the like, like I the Mac wise, because yeah, and I try to make it similar, like con I try to make it so. I actually do this as a curiosity, um, and sometimes I remember to look into it. Sometimes I don't, but you'll you probably noticed that on the in person exam, there's usually a multiple choice question that's like exactly what was on the lab pal portion, like calculate your end value for the hydrogen, like, calculate the, the number of photons. Like, uh, and it's just because I want to see is like, oh, are people getting it like all right? Like, is everyone getting it right online, but then getting it wrong in person? Are they depending too much on their notes? I'm not going to say people are looking it up, but like, are they depending too much on their notes versus like being able to actually think about it? And every once in a while, I remember to check it. For example, that that hydrogen problem, um, that. Finally, on the last quiz, was at 60% correct? Oh, with the Redford's equation? Yeah, the Redford <laughs> equation problem, it took us nine weeks to get from, get it to 60% correct. Might still be good to have on the final, who knows? Yeah. Um, but, like, like it's kind of nice now that most people are getting it right. Now, now most people are like, yeah, do it again. I got it. Um, but yeah, so like, it, the, like that problem, the reason I bring that one up is because um, a similar percentage of people are getting it wrong online and in person, which is good for me to see because it makes me look at that and be like, okay, I, I don't think people are just Googling stuff during the online portion. Otherwise, I'd see a huge spike in people getting it correct. And I didn't see a huge spike in people getting it correct for five weeks. So I don't think people are trying to Google answers on the online portion. At least not not en masse. Maybe one person, two people here and there. And they shouldn't be, but yeah. It gives me that kind of like check of like, are my online and my in-person kind of testing the same stuff in a reasonable way? So I usually have questions like that. And there'll probably be some like that on the final exam as well. Uh, other questions?
questions. Yeah. Can I give it a two part, like a midterm something, or just one in person? All in person. Okay. Multiple choice for your response. Yeah. I just have a question for like 8.1 left. Sure. Are we ready to move on from stoichiometry? Again, try those stoichiometry worksheets. If you want to bring those in, we can work on those during office hours next week to make sure we're getting a handle on stoichiometry. Um, but let's go take a look at 8.1. I think it is still stored. It was still stored. Okay, great. Do this real quick. What was that other one we did? 27? Okay. You said 8.1? Yeah. Number 12. Okay. Um, let's take a look at it. Uh, what was that concentration? 0.1 sodium hydroxide. Mm -hmm. um, the titration requires 54.2 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution to completely neutralize 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid. And 20 asking, milliliters? Yeah, 20. And yeah. they're asking what the molarity of the sulfuric acid solution is. Oh, wait, read that. Read, read the, just read the whole question again real quick. A student titrates a sulfuric acid solution of unknown concentration with, with 0.1 molarity of sodium hydroxide. The titration requires 54.2 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution to completely neutralize 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid solution. What was the concentration of the sulfuric acid solution? Now, there is an important phrase there. I mentioned that this was an important thing to look at for in class. We're going to see it written in a couple different ways, but it's to equivalence point, or to the end point, or to completely neutralize, or to completely react, or to um, e hit the equal molar point, right? All of those things, this phrase right here, and that's why I wanted you to read it again, is because this phrase right here, this is an important phrase. That phrase means my molarity of at, oh sorry, this means my moles of acid, equal to my moles of base times the mole ratio. Right, that phrase tells us this really important part. Right, essentially this is like we did in the titration lab yesterday where it's like, that means they got faint pink. And so we know our moles of acid are equal to our moles of base times the mole ratio. So let's look at what we know and what we don't know. Um, How do we calculate our moles of base from the information we have? Um, I would do 54.2 milliliters and then convert that to the same. Multiply it by liters. Ooh. Like one liter of sodium hydroxide. You were really close. So there's kind of there's two different things that we really look for, right? And it's the two things I wrote on the board yesterday, which is we've got our molarity times volume equals moles, and we got our molecular weight times, or sorry, or we've got our grams, our mass, divided by molecular weight equals moles. Those are the two things that we use really often. We talked about them back in like week one of the quarter. And they came back a little bit in a couple other places. But now that we're in like week eight and week nine uh, and week 10, they're coming back a lot. So we're going to use this molarity volume thing to get our moles because we've got a molarity and a volume. So you were right to convert this, but then we just multiply by the point one. So uh, we can get our moles of base. is equal to 0.1 molarity, which I could actually rewrite 0.1 molarity as 0.1 moles of base. Um, 
moles of NaOH for one liter. All right, it's moles per liter. And then I'm going to multiply by, I'm just going to do the conversion in my head if it's okay, 0 0.0542 liters. I just divided by 1,000, moved this decimal place over three times. Is that okay? So that I get me my moles of base. That's going to be 0 0.00542, because multiplying by 0.1 is just dividing by 10. So I've got my moles of sodium hydroxide figured out. Now we're going to do something similar for our moles of acid, except for there's something we don't know. There's two things we don't know. Um, my moles of acid is going to be equal to my molarity of acid times 0 0.02 liters. This thing is what it's asking me to find out. I'm kind of doing my whole implied explicit, like my explicit implied result thing in a little bit of a sloppy way. I should have been more careful. Um, but that's the thing that we're trying to find out. We're trying to find our molarity of acid. So I should be able to just set these two things equal to each other, and it should be good, right? Almost what I forget. Don't forget the mole ratio. Really common in acid-base chemistry, the mole ratio, like we saw last night in the lab, the mole ratio is just one to one, so we just do moles of acid equals moles of base. It's easy, no problem. You can't forget the mole ratio there, though. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to write a balanced chemical reaction for this. It's not surprising, we're doing stoichiometry. Um, so I'm gonna have sulfuric acid. Do you remember what sulfuric acid is? What's it going to have in it? It's going to have an H because it's an acid. It's going to have an S and some O's. It's going to be H2SO4. I'm going to add sodium hydroxide to that. I'm going to do my flip-flop. I'm going to do my hydrogens, my, my two positive things. My sodium replaces my hydrogen. My hydrogen replaces my sodium. <coughs> that will get me... NaSO4 plus, I'm going to write it in a little bit of a funny way, HOH, right, because this H is going to go with that OH. Charge balance things, I need a subscript on my sodium, my HOH is okay. Then I can go ahead and do my coefficients. I'm going to need two sodiums, and I'm going to need two H's and two OH's. Usually we write HOH is just H2O. I sometimes actually like writing it as HOH, so I can kind of see two hydroxides, two OHs. And I can see two hydrogens, two hydrogens. So it's a little bit easier for me to balance water when I see it as HOH. If it doesn't help you, don't worry about that, but it makes sense for me with the flip-flop and then with the balancing. So my ratio of acid to base is a one to two mole ratio. So I'm going to have one mole acid for two moles base. And that will be my mole ratio. I didn't really give myself enough space to do that. Um, so that means our final equation can be... Someone needs to come. We'll go back to blue for this. We're going to have our molarity of acid times 0 0.02 whoa, times 0 0.02 is equal to 0 0.00542 moles NaOH times 2 moles NaOH every one mole, H2SO4. My units of moles of NaOH will cancel out. I'll divide it by the 0 0.02, and that should get me the answer. So there were a couple important thought steps to do here. Step number one was realizing that completely neutralized means the moles of acid is equal to the moles of base times the mole ratio. 
Step number two was figuring out what that mole ratio was. I didn't do it as the second one, but it should have been my second one. Figure out what the mole ratio is by writing a balanced chemical reaction. Step number three was using the information given to get our moles of base, and then we can solve. Right? But there were multiple. The most important thought step was the completely neutralized tells us the moles of acid is equal to the moles of base times the mole ratio. That was the most important thought step that was most kind of like implied and not explicitly told. You bet. Oh, my camera angle's all off. That's worse. Good enough. Whatever. Uh, other questions? What time is it? Oh, it's 3.40. 3.45. We got a little bit of time left in office hours. I'm going to go ahead and, well, are there other questions? I'm going to stop the recording. I have midterms to give back to people, and we can talk a little bit about grades if people want to talk about grades.